be your children, and that someday we'll all be found with you in heaven. We thank you, Father, for this time of the year. We know that it's not the celebration that some people would like to have, but it is the birth of your son, Jesus, the life that he lived, the lessons that he taught that we might have hope and eternal life with you. Father, we thank you so much for our <clears throat> older people that we have here. We ask that you be with them, especially those that have got health problems right now, that are, that are home, that are under doctor's care. We pray that you would put your healing hand upon them and heal them, especially in this time of the year. Father, we ask that you be with all of those that are be traveling in the next month or so, that you watch the guard protect over them, and <clears throat> let them have safe trips to and from their loved ones and bring them back home safely. Father, we thank you for all that you give us. We ask that you give us a, a, a better year in this upcoming year than the last one has been. Father, we thank you so much for your, your blessings that you give us each day. We thank you for the church here at Kimball and its leadership. We pray that you would always be with the elders. Let them make the decisions that would help lead us forward and make the Christians of us all. Father, we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning will come from 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he demands is a liar, and the love and the truth is not him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. I'm 371. 371. This morning we'll sing the first verse of the song. Prepare my to take the mindset. 371. When we meet and sleep, Thank <laughs> you. 
or even most. When we come into Christ, God forgives all sin. You know, there's only one unpardonable sin in the Bible, and quite honestly, I'm not even sure we can commit that today. And so, when someone comes along and they're studying about becoming a Christian and they think about their own sinful life, you know, it's hard for people to understand sometimes that God forgives all things. He doesn't hold one over us, so He's got something to use for letters. But God forgives all sins. Again, Paul emphasizes our in Christ alone. In Ephesians 1 7, when he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Honestly, I don't think we're going to fully comprehend God's grace on this earth. I think it's too great. It's, I think it is beyond human capability to take it in. But if we're going to understand grace, we have to understand it in the cross. That a perfectly innocent woman would willingly... And think about it, folks. Jesus came into this world knowing he was going to face the cross and he was going to bear the sin of the world. He came knowing that was going to happen. And he did it freely. Because that was God's way of bringing about redemption and sin. So in Christ alone is forgiveness of all past sin. Did you know? It doesn't stop there. And that's even more amazing. In Christ alone, His blood continues to cleanse us from present sin. In Romans chapter 7, Paul writes about his dilemma. When he lived under the law, he had good intentions. He really wanted to do the will of God. He really, really tried. He was probably as sincere a Jew as there was in the first century. And as he gets to the end of that inspired chapter, he writes an interesting statement. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me because of the war between the Spirit and the flesh? Well, he answers that question for us in chapter 1, verse 8. He tells us precisely who will deliver us. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's put a little there again. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Why? How? I mean, we're human. Because we've become a Christian doesn't suddenly mean that the good fairies mocked us on the head with a magic wand and we can no longer sin. We still struggle with so many things in life. How can there be no condemnation? John answers that for us. 1 John 1 7, he says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Not some sin. Not most sin. All sin. Now, am I standing before you and saying that Christians are spotless? They're sinless? They have no sin? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm not saying we don't sin. 
I'm saying we don't bear those things. If we are walking in the light, we are living the light Jesus wants us to live, His blood is continually working on our life. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Not because we're perfect. Not because we're deserving of it. Not because we don't make mistakes. Not because sometimes we don't fall flat on our face and have to try to rise up again. It's because of who He is. And because of what he did. And the power that is in Christ alone. It's not our power. It's God's redemptive power in His Son, Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, in the first part of that verse, John writes and basically tells us our goal is not to sin. And so do not anyone walk out of here today thinking, well, Billy gave me license to go out and commit any sin I want to because the blood of Jesus is going to cleanse me. Uh-uh. I'm not doing that. The goal is never to sin. But then the verse goes on and says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so as His children, as we struggle when we are not righteous, His righteousness can still make us son. Uh, but just like salvation, this continual cleansing, this continual forgiving is in Christ alone. But in the third place, in Christ alone is a new life. Romans 6 and verse 4. Therefore, when we are buried with Him in baptism in the death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life, placed in Christ alone there. That's where that new life is. In Christ. In the life He wants us to live in the example that He set for us. There is where is real life. You know, in John 10, 10, He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And truly, the Christian life is that abundant life. Look at lost people around you. They're not living. They're existing. They're not going through life with a, with a goal and a purpose and a drive pushing them forward, most of them at least. They're merely muddling through life. They're merely going from one day to the next in the same rut they've been in all their life. And yet, a rut's nothing but great if they can just knock out it. Jesus came along to give us a life, an abundant life, a purpose for living, a purpose for existing. And so Paul, this real sincere Jew, could later write in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's the new life. That's what it's all about. That's that new purpose. That we allow Christ to live in us. And by His living in us, we live out His life before a 21st century world. And believe me, they really, really do. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul put it this way. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know what comes to my mind when I read this passage of Scripture every time? Noah and his family leaving that ark for the first time. Wow. A new world. A fresh world. A world to start all over again in. Well, guess what? When we come up out of that watery grave of baptism, we enter that new world. We as Christians of all people on earth truly have a second chance at life. And in Christ alone, we have this second chance to be able to get it right this time. We messed it up the first time, but we get to start over. Peter put it this way, verse Peter 2, 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we had died to sin. Realize the idea of death is also an idea of separation. So in Christ alone, we have separated ourselves from sin. Peter goes on and says, we might live for righteousness. I think a while back I told a story about a young woman, this uh, young man that set his affections on her and he really wanted to date her and so he asked her to go to a party with him and she said no because that wouldn't be the place she needed to be. And so he asked her to go somewhere else and she refused. And after the third refusal, he said, what do you do for fun? And she said, I go to bed every night with a clean conscience. And that's fun. Isn't it? Isn't it fun to go to bed at night and not be tormented by all the wrong things you did that day? Because in Christ alone, you've got a new life now. But there's one more thing. And as good as three, these three points are, this fourth one is kind of the, the ice cream on top of the pie. In Christ alone is the hope of heaven. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children of God, heirs, joint heirs, with Jesus Christ. You know what that verse is saying? In Christ alone, you and I have bought into the inheritance that is heaven. And not just a little bit of speck. Joint heirs, equal heirs with Jesus Christ. I was reading an article and this atheist was stressing his belief that when he finished living his life, he was sure he was dead, totally dead, absolutely dead, and that he would never exist again. And you know what I thought when I read that? How pivotal. How tragic. How horrible to think that this old world with all the troubles and problems and everything else it has is the best thing we have to hope for. In fact, Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life is the only life we have hope as Christians, we're all people to be most pitied. But we don't need to be pitied. Paul tells us in Colossians 3 and verse 4, 
when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. When He comes, those that are in Christ alone are going to go back with Him. And He's not going to leave anybody behind. He's not going to miss out on somebody. There's not going to be any misjudgment. Those that are in Christ alone will be in heaven forever. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, put the love in there, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And you know where the settlement's going to be? Not in Kimball, or Sequatchie, or Jasper, or South Pittsburgh, or wherever you might reside. The settlement's not going to be on this earth. The settlement's going to be with God and Jesus in heaven. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 tells us that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. We can put alone there. But then He says, He who has the Son has life. In Christ alone is forgiveness of past sins. In Christ alone is forgiveness of present sins. In Christ alone is new life. And in Christ alone, heaven is possible. Are you in Christ alone? If not, I plead with you this morning. Please come to me. Please believe on me with all your heart. Please turn from your sin. Confess the precious name of Jesus. Wash away those sins in the waters of baptism that you can be raised to walk in that new life. In Christ alone. But maybe you're here today and you haven't been abiding in Christ. You turn to come back in the world. Wake up. Come back. Get back in Christ alone again. So heaven one day can be yours. And if you need to respond, in Christ alone is everything you need. There's your time.